Hello, everyone. My name is Don Means. This is session 12 of the series, What is a Library if the Building is Closed? Uh, we're honored to have two extraordinary guests today. Uh, let me get the slideshow here happening. Prioritizing in crisis, that's what we're calling it today. Uh, it's just extraordinary what's been going on. Uh, we're all aware of the pandemic. We're all aware of the, the new uh, uh, racism crisis that's come upon us. It's just, it's like one crisis after another. They're almost cascading. Uh, how, to, how to deal with all that? You're just barely getting your hand, hands around one issue and then another one hits you and then another one after that. Uh, we, we've got uh, economic crisis, uh, unemployment levels or just, you know, uh, depression era levels. We've got a climate crisis that just does not seem to pay any attention to the pandemic. Uh, we're expecting a heavy hurricane season this year. So uh, my hat's off to everybody that's trying to operate uh, a library or any institution in this environment. Uh, we took off last week just out of acknowledgement of what was going on and uh, well, we're back and, and, uh, and, and staying with it. I mean, you know, we have to keep working every day. Uh, these sessions are hosted by uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. Stephen Weiber is at the controls there in the Netherlands. Uh, and we thank you, Stephen. We thank IFLA. Uh, our media co-host is Broadband Breakfast. Uh, they've been giving us some good uh, publicity and, and coverage. We certainly appreciate them. Uh, and uh, the, the sessions are recorded. Being rec This one's being recorded right now. Uh, they're all archived and stored on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. Uh, we'll be muting everyone, uh, most everyone, uh, in the beginning, and then you'll be able to unmute as you need to. Uh, also, uh, someone kindly offered to, you know, share the... <laughs> the opportunity to, to uh, participate in these seminars and uh, we should put that up at top, you know, please share. So absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, we've had a, a late surge of registration just this morning in the last hour. So maybe somebody is doing something like that and we appreciate it. Um, so I also, before we get going, I want to introduce John Windhausen, who is the executive director of the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition, Shelby, shelby.org, S-H-L-B.org. Shelby, as many of you would know, is the leading policy voice for broadband for anchor institutions in the U.S. Uh, and has been responsible over the last 10 years for some impressive changes in policy, uh, programs, subsidy programs, uh, all the way back to uh, uh, BTOP and the National Broadband Plan in 2009 when Shelby first started. Um, I highly recommend exploring membership in Shelby. The Anchor Institution uh, annual dues get as low as $250 a year. Extremely reasonable to have a voice into Washington and have an ear in Washington to hear what's going on. Uh, it's, it's amazing organization. John is on uh, to tell us what uh, Shelby is proposing uh, related to the, the basically the, the connectivity crisis, which is just not being addressed and which we'll be talking about later today. So John, welcome. Uh, tell us what's going on. Let me, let me stop the share here. Okay, well, thanks, Don, very much for that uh, really wonderful introduction that you gave to me. Uh, and since you uh, tracked the Shelby history a little bit, I'll mention that yesterday on June 11th was the 11th year anniversary of the founding of the Shelby Coalition. <laughs> so we're very pleased to be able to continue to be here. We've made the transition off of Gates Foundation funding, and now we're self-sustaining based on membership. And Don, it's great. You, you know, you helped 
get us here as the founding chairman of the board of the Shelby Coalition for several years. So I want to ex again express my gratitude to you for getting this going, getting Shelby going, and then continuing this good work with these webinars. Um, I won't take a lot of time because I know you've got some great speakers lined up, but I uh, did appreciate the invitation, uh, Don, that you gave to me just to brief everybody about this new bill that we just released yesterday. And we think this may have some promise uh, to be adopted by the US Congress this summer. Um, it's a bill that we're calling the Remote Learning During COVID-19 Act. And it would fund uh, uh, appropriate five and a quarter billion dollars to the FCC to make available to schools and libraries to help connect students and library patrons at home. So uh, we think this is a significant initiative uh, and it's going to help deal with the crisis that you just talked about, where schools and libraries are not gonna be back up to full speed in the fall. Uh, and an awful lot of children and students are still going to be at home. We don't quite know how many, but almost every school that we've talked to says they're going to be having a hybrid learning model where they're going to be either alternating or staggering the school schedule, some days at school, some days at home. So that broadband connection is critically important to have at home, but, but about 10% of households uh, don't have broadband at home. And our estimate is 7 million families don't have, can't afford broadband at home. So this bill would help to plug that gap and uh, also go to libraries. So it would not be, the change we made in the last couple of weeks was to say, okay, this is, we're not gonna run this through the E-rate program. The money's still gonna go to the FCC, but we're suggesting the FCC should set this up as a separate program. We think it will borrow from a lot of the existing E-rate processes in how the FCC actually administers the funding. But the Republicans seem to be more comfortable if it's not within E-rate, but separate from E-rate. So this new version of our bill that we released yesterday makes that change. It uh, doesn't change a lot of the substance of it, but we think this is more likely to gain some bipartisan support. Um, and we issued a letter yesterday signed by 1900 individuals from around the United States, including many, many libraries. Uh, in favor of this bill. And the bill is also uh, supported by COSLA, the chief operators of state library agencies, and the last minute endorsement from ALA, the American Library Association, came in just the night before yesterday. So we're very pleased to be able to mention this bill. As Don said, it's on our website at shlb.org. And we invite you to follow uh, the progress uh, as we present this to Congress. And uh, we hope that this can be included in the coronavirus stimulus bill that uh, even Mitch McConnell says he's going to be putting something together. Uh, and we hope to be included in that bill that's passed in July. So Don, thank you again. Uh, happy to answer any questions either here or offline. My email is jwindhausen at shlb.org if you have any follow-up questions for me. You can type that in the uh, chat, John, if you want to. Oh, Thanks very much. This is, this is really important, of course. Uh, this particular challenge that this bill and your, your uh, proposal is designed to address may be the single biggest social challenge we have right now. I mean, of course, there's the health issues, but if, if school is not in session, basically society is mm, paralyzed. I mean, we have to have school, but we can't really have school now without good access to school, which is more or less online. And as you say, you know, the schools are struggling trying to figure out the, just what seemed like impossible logistics of managing, you know, even in the best of times. But now it just looks uh, like an incredible challenge. And we're gonna be tracking that very closely, doing whatever we can. We know libraries are offering a, a whole range of support in this crisis mostly in terms of supporting parents who have become, who've just been drafted into being, you know, stay at home teachers and tutors. And they go, what are we talking about here? So uh, it, it's, a, it's a really big one. We're gonna have uh, uh, guests on future sessions speaking directly to this issue. We're gonna talk about it in terms of the infrastructure uh, possibilities uh, today. So anyone question for John? Uh, John, you have uh, likelihood or are there, 
you, you have sponsors yet for this uh, proposed bill? Uh, we don't have sponsors yet, uh, but we are working on that. And we are trying to make a, a, a bipartisan approach from the get-go. Uh, there is another bill in Congress that is totally supported by Democrats. Uh, and that, that is a good bill by Senator Markey. It's not a great bill. We think our bill is better. And we think we can get more bipartisan uh, support for our approach. We had Joey Winder on uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about that bill, that very thing. And, and uh, he, was, uh, he was a little defensive when we asked him why it wasn't $5.25 billion and only $4 billion. And he was like, <laughs> well, we, we're doing the best we can. And I'm sure that's true. This is, this is really difficult times. Uh, and uh, Shelby's had good, ex good success getting bipartisan support for various positions, not only uh, FCC rule changes, but legislation as this, uh, uh, this inspired piece of uh, proposal does. <laughs> it, it takes a lot of people out of their comfort zone to actually support students at home where this has not been the, uh, the normal daily uh, responsibilities of our anchor institutions. Uh, but increasingly, you know, it's somebody has to do that. And a lot of anchor institutions are stepping up. So, John, thank you very much for taking the time out today. We know you've got another, uh, another call going on there, and we appreciate this. Looks like you're roughing it, though. Uh, oh, that's a fake background, isn't it? Yeah, okay. That's very cool. <laughs> these days. Yeah. No, no, it's real. It's real. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, well, thanks again, John, and good okay. luck on this. And, and, um, Put any other links up there that you'd like uh, for people to pay attention to, and then we'll we'll include this in the notes in our follow up uh, email for the session. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much, Don. Okay. Bye bye. So uh, let's get back to the program. Uh, sorry, I should be a little faster at doing all this, having done it a few times now. So um, before we get to our speakers, who we have two outstanding uh, library, and champion, library champions with us today, uh, Kelvin Watson, the director of the Broward County Libraries, a 38 branch system, uh, Broward County, just north of Miami-Dade. Uh, Kelvin and I have known each other for a number of years. We met at a PLA conference in Colorado a, a number of years ago, we were presenting together. Uh, Eric Kleinberg may not be on quite yet. He said he was going to be late. Uh, Eric's well known as the author of Palaces to the People. And uh, we've, we're very interested to hear how Eric sees this uh, new world where uh, the, the library as space is a completely different proposition today. Uh, the oh, whole I want to now I'm here. Okay, Eric, welcome. Good morning. So, um, good morning. Uh, uh, the context for these, the series basically started in late March around this question. All the libraries were closed. They're still mostly closed or still all closed as buildings. So what does it mean? What is, what is a library if the building is closed? And uh, it just seemed like an interesting question at the moment in late March. And then it began to uh, uh, attract a number of interesting people and questions related to that. Oh, internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure, which uh, was added as a, a fourth and kind of obvious uh, aspect of the question when we had a presentation from a librarian in uh, Denmark who talked about the role of the library in community cohesion. And, uh, and so these are more or less the, the, the topical subtopics under this question that we've been exploring uh, up to now, what is the twelfth session in the series of, of uh, related to the to the question and what's happening in library transformation? Assuring access to public information as an essential service is kind of our mantra here. Uh, now more than ever, uh, in public information, we mean the open internet. We also specifically mean government information, public services that everyone, absolutely everyone, has a right to access. It's just the nature of, of government services for, for everyone. It, it is what libraries do, and, and it's what they do the best. Uh, uh, gigabit libraries, we're open collaboration. 
are happy to have anybody join people, libraries that are doing interesting things with technology uh, for a whole range of, of reasons. Just today, just to, actually a couple of hours ago, Fast Company uh, put up this article on uh, just what John was pointing out and what is in fact a uh, really a critical situation. And this is not just today, this is not just since the pandemic. This is the general connectivity environment in mostly in rural areas. And, and I point to this quote there, this is from you know, the 4-H Council, that 43% of the teens living in rural areas will leave because they don't have good access. They don't have an opportunity to participate in an economic, social, uh, environment that, that we're all accustomed to, I say all of us, most of us are accustomed to. And what that means for rural communities is basically, you know, no future if that many of your children just leave town. They're also going to probably be the more motivated ones, the ones you very, one, very much want to keep. So we have the technology, we certainly have the need, and this is an image of uh, a fire in 2008. Angel Islands, middle of the San Francisco Bay. And it was a just, and, and at that time, this, this super yacht, which is in the foreground, the Maltese Falcon, was in town for supporting a, a cancer fundraiser. And it's just anchored there off of, off of Sausalito. Uh, and so this image just captures as a metaphor so much of, of what we thought was going on 10 years ago, what's going on today. You know, the world is aflame, crisis on crisis, and yet we have extraordinary technology. This yacht is, the so-called super yacht, uh, ha has to wait for low tide to go under the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, one person can sail this thing. If you can imagine that, you know, it's, it's all automated, these sails, uh, you know, everything. So technology is not the barrier to, to, this, uh, to this particular connectivity crisis. It's more will. So uh, we uh, just to quickly finish here. We're going to uh, we're going to start a uh, a new wireless thread next week. Uh, this is basically about Wi-Fi and how people connect via Wi-Fi, and uh, and where it is and and where it isn't, and what libraries can do to extend it and expand it. Not just libraries, but uh, Anchor institutions in general, libraries working with schools is, is really a high priority for us to, uh, to advocate. This is uh, basically going to cover a range of spectrum and access strategies that are available today that can increase inclusion and community resilience, not just against COVID, but against natural disasters, which don't seem to care whether COVID is around or not, uh, and, and to try to meet the urgent learning and information needs of their communities. We'll look at different leading wireless technologies. I mean, reading it like this, it just looks like an alphabet soup of, of uh, telecom acronyms, which in fact it is. But these are all real technologies representing specific types of licenses or license exempt uh, resource asset, uh, spectrum assets. And, and you should know what you have in your community and, and immediately try to find out and many of these are, are open, uh, like Wi-Fi. This five gigahertz is, is, a, is a Wi-Fi standard. Six gigahertz is supposed to roll out in a couple of months. It's being finalized now, much, much faster, and, and a spectrum that's being less used. So these all represent potential kinds of capability that you might use in your community to extend access to places where it, where it now, now is not. Uh, connecting anchor institutions directly to each other as a backup uh, is a smart move. And then connecting other places around the community that are like neighborhood fixed hotspots. This could be used, some of these could be used for mobile, but that's the, the near term is to try to, at least in our view, is the simplest, cheapest, quickest way to respond to this crisis is to, to set up new uh, neighborhood library access stations, if you'll allow. Uh, that people uh, are at least within walking distance or, or driving distance of a, of a public access point because there's so many people that are just stuck and they're having to drive all the way to whatever, whatever the school or library parking lot is. Uh, it should go much further and that was the point of John's uh, talk and the bill is to, is to reach all of these homes. 
So let's get to it uh, and uh, and get just to our speakers who I've basically introduced already. So uh, Kelvin, I am going to release the share here. and uh, ask you to take it away. Kelvin, Kelvin Watson, Director of the Broward County Library System. Kelvin? Thanks, Don. Good morning, everybody. Um, how, I hope everybody's doing well. So, you know, I'm known, as Don mentioned, I've known him for a few years, and if he, if he recalls, and, and I also know some of the folks who are on, the, uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting as well when I check the uh, roster, you, you would know that I have been focusing on this, what is a library, is a library a building, virtual library access for many years, as well as um, helping to bridge the digital divide. So as part of Broward County's efforts, when the pandemic hit, we had already put some things in place to prepare for um, having virtual library access available in our community. For example, we, over the past three years that I've been director, we have put library uh, access for downloading our digital resources, for example, on our uh, transit, on our buses. So our transit system, you can actually get access to our uh, library resources. We have Wi-Fi enabled buses. We also worked with our parks to actually have the library be a part of our park system. And we also have rolled out within the past year, a library location in the airport. We also leverage um, coffee shops. We've, we've worked with gyms, the local hospitals, as well as um, some of our elderly care facilities in the community. Within the first couple of months of my arriving, we, we rolled out a similar uh, project that I had done in, in Queens, which was to have uh, broadband access available for lending to the public. So we started lending um, Wi-Fi enabled tablets uh, where the library pays the, the, the data plan, but we also preloaded the devices with not only the library's uh, electronic resources, but we also loaded the Broward County Schools electronic resources on those devices as well. Along with that, we rolled out a, a hotspot program um, targeted initially at, uh, at veterans. We called it Veterans Connect. Uh, Florida is a big veterans population, so that was an approach that we, that we used um, here as well. So when the pandemic hit, again, we had already been working to put things in place with our with uh, online and virtual uh, story times and services. But I would have to admittedly say that we weren't still 100% prepared with what we have been doing over the past couple of months. We have shifted primarily to a virtual, uh, all virtual library with limited access to uh, to our physical resources. We rolled out that uh, physical resources uh, connect, connections with our, we, have, we call it curbside walk-up library to go service um, about three weeks ago. So we were now, you can now pick up your physical material, holes, et cetera, um, um, by, by making a, a reservation, uh, an appointment to pick those up from the, from the library. But holistically, we've become a, a library system that is doing online story, more online story times, uh, online uh, reference. Um, we, even though we have, um, you know, these uh, systems in place, we've become a, a uh, I guess you could almost say more of a, as a for-profit company, we've increased our social media uh, heavily, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, to continue to promote not just the services that the library has available, but we have promoted um, our uh, community partners. So we have uh, here in Broward, we have a Holocaust Educational Center, and they have resources. So we've been able to push out their resources. 
for uh, you know for them as well as the the work that they do. We have museums that we've been pushing out their content. So part of this has been a uh, that that's made it work for the community is that we've been that the libraries continue to be that that connector of information and resources and not just about you know consumption and instruction but actually being what i refer to as the center of uh, of culture the library is the center of culture and so you know some lessons learned in this process is that and, and john certainly touched on it um i've as i mentioned i've been working on this for over 20 years and that you know bridging the digital divide not only in rural areas but also in urban areas as well understanding that broadband is a necessary utility and not a luxury um that that people um uh, you know you don't have you know schools um here in the community the the schools not not in partnership with the libraries they decided that they would provide uh, Google um, Chrome tablets and devices um, and uh, laptops to students. Um, and they said to the parents, well, you can just go to Comcast. They have a program that they're offering uh, the internet access to um, for you to for you to be able to you know have that at your home. What they didn't take into account was that that really is only for new customers, not existing customers. So if you had a, a bill uh, an outstanding bill with Comcast, you weren't able to get that service. So the library actually was able to step in and fill that, um, you know, fill that gap. Um, one of the other things that we had done um, is uh, partnering um, ahead of time with the schools through a project that we work with uh, Baker and Taylor you know, on, I'm not necessarily trying to promote their their company, but th we worked with them on a on a project called Community Share, and so we had about seventy five to eighty thousand um, school students already um, with a digital library card from the from us uh, from the library where they're able to not only access the school's resources but they're able to access resources that the library has purchased on their behalf what we saw um when we looked at the numbers comparing march 2019 to march 20 is that we had a 68 percent increase in usage of that material which for us was significant because that we weren't really seeing those types of numbers prior to uh, the pandemic so um I don't know how I'm doing on time, Don. You got to keep. I hadn't. I didn't set a clock. But uh, so doing for, great. So for for libraries, and I've been I've been speaking a lot um, over the past um, few weeks about you know libraries and as I've said, you know having being able to be prepared virtually for Broward County libraries, where we've set the path to be a uh, there's going to be some physical services that we're going to be doing in the future, but we are primarily going to be continually focusing on this virtual, uh, these virtual services that we offer. I've challenged my team. They've already started. Um, and other libraries are doing this as well. Summer learning is going to be all online here for, um, for the community. We started that uh, uh, June 1st. And we're getting a lot of um, we're getting a lot of uh, service uh, you know service being provided that way. But now we have a plan to to uh, duplicate whatever physical programming, if possible, that we were doing in um, in the library. That we have a virtual digital component of that service. Um, so that's one of the plans for that we've put in place, and we've already begun to execute that. Um, the other work that I've been doing, um, based on my, you know, many affiliations is looking at the, uh, the publisher licensing models when it comes to digital content. And so that's a, that's a, a, a place where we are, uh, libraries, public library association, digital content working group from ALA and others have ramped that conversation back up 
um, to hopefully uh, move the needle on getting on, on having some licensing models that work because that's an area where we've spent more money uh, on than we had previously prepared to spend before the pandemic. All right. So I see you down. So I'm, on, I'm on, I guess I'm, I'm looking at this time. We got 30 minutes left. I know you got some other topics. So, well, but you know, you're, you've touched a bunch of topics there, uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, so you mentioned that you've begun to open up, uh, you're doing curbside walk up kind of services. Uh, you mentioned, we spoke earlier that, that libraries districts around you are actually opening, planning to open their buildings, to have patrons come back in and yes. you're, you're not doing that right away, right? Not right away. Both Palm Beach County, which is uh, to the north of us and Miami-Dade County to the south of us have, have opened up their buildings within the last couple of weeks. Um, and for Broward, um, what we're doing is really, really looking at the, um, uh, the number of cases that continue to, uh, uh, go up here it is not they're not significantly going up but they're certainly going up here in South Florida and so we are you know taking our time in in opening up uh, libraries as well as other uh, other community entities um, here uh, in, in in the county well that sounds like smart policy uh, let other people uh, guinea pig uh, you know see what happens a couple of weeks later it's not that big of a, a penalty, uh, though I know a lot of people are eager to, to get their full library services going on. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I mean, we this whole thing was set up in response to the crisis of the pandemic. And then now in the past few weeks, we have a, a compounding crisis of, of racism, which is not, of course, new at all, but the, but the response to it. The, the recent events, the, the, the murders, we can say, that have happened recently uh, have just brought it to the fore. So I'd like to ask you, Kelvin, as a black man, uh, what, what do you think are the, the institutional biases in libraries? I mean, libraries, the response I think most libraries have is, well, you know, we're open to all, we're, we're fine, we're cool. But I suspect there must be, I certainly see them in myself, but I, I suspect that we all have certain predispositions, preconceptions, and inbuilt biases in, in how we do. What, do you think that, that libraries have certain, you know, lack of awareness that they, that they could have in, in response to what's going on right now? So what I'll say, uh, Don, is that um, from my, my opinion, Systematic and institutionalized racism has been an existent threat to the black community for centuries. You know, um, going back to the, you know the 1600s and and, and even further. Um, and so, even as we as we look at this, uh, and libraries as well as others need systematic reforms to end racial injustices. Right? You need to look at your you need to look in the mirror. You need to, there's, there's there's certainly learning opportunities for us all. Um, you know, racism has seemed to be um, what I would say encoded into our 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 country's DNA. Um, you know, whether that is a conscious or unconscious. Um, I registered for a webinar. Oh, okay. Uh, it's it, called. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and, and, and that racism is in our, you know, our laws, our policies, and in some cases in different programs that are, are, are available. Um, and so from a library perspective, as well as I guess from my own personal experience, a, a, my own personal comments would be that we need some systematic solutions to solve it. Um, you know, libraries, um, what we need to do um, is to continue to deliver services that focus on um, the intersection of all issues. We're for everybody. Uh, when, I, when I arrived here as director, um, one of our 
one of our goals, and I, I call it a goal, but it's actually what we've been working to um, embed in everybody is that we invite the uninvited. So that's our that's our that's our thematic Broward County theme: inviting the uninvited. And so everything that we do is surrounding that. That is for the people, the haves, the have-nots, the black, white, you know, Asian, Hispanic. And so if you look at all of what we've been doing is we've really worked on adopting services and strategies to help bridge any gap uh, that, is, that is there. You know, I talked about the digital divide earlier, but also, um, you know, we're gonna have, you know, um, that we have now even higher unemployment rates. So we're going to be working to do workforce, uh, workforce, workforce development, both virtually as well as you know, in you know, whenever we open in, in person. Um, you know, so from a library perspective, it's the actions that we take. You know, it's the actions that we take in looking at ourselves reflectively and looking at our teams. Um, our staff, our makeup, our administrations, and ensuring through those actions that there is some, um, that there is diversity, not only in um, ethnicity, but also diversity um, in the different people, the people, right? Where they come from, where, what their backgrounds are. And that's, you know, those are those are some of my some of my thoughts since I, I knew you were gonna ask you this question. I had had an opportunity to think about it um and, and wanted to be able to uh articulate my, my thoughts. Um well it's you know I it's a big question. Uh you know libraries start out ahead because they treat everyone equally. I mean this is this is a deep, deep value that libraries have that I think uh honor everyone who walks in the door the same. And it's, I'm sure it's made a lot of different in a lot of people's lives. And, and I appreciate, you know, your, your perspectives and differentiating those as personal versus uh, kind of official. And, and, but it just seemed like a great opportunity to have you kind of speak to this uh, uh, from your own perspective as well. So uh, I, I, I take your, your points. I hope uh, everybody also is looking at, you know what we can do more what what we can how we can do things differently rather than just kind of ignore it and you're right about you know this this dna is what ken burns called it the original sin of uh, of uh, the the constitution and, and the country and we're still still trying to work our way out of it and maybe this is a time we can make make some real progress on it but thank you very much kelvin not just for that but for your all your work in, in the library I was most impressed with the way you described your relationships with other community institutions. That's, that's a great setup for, uh, for our next speaker, Eric, uh, on the, this role in the community, the co community cohesion, not just the digital services and the, and the, uh, and the physical materials, but uh, the wider picture and the, the cultural uh, and, and civic uh, role of libraries in their communities beyond educational. So, so Eric, um, are you, you're there. I know you are. Yeah, so, right here, yeah. okay, well, please welcome, uh, Eric Kleinberg. Everybody knows you from your book. It's extremely famous book of palaces for the people. And, uh, I, I believe that's a Carnegie quote. And, and so why don't you tell us how you see, library as place when the building is closed. What's, how different sure. is your view yeah. of the library world now? I'm happy to do that. Thank you for having me here. Thanks, thanks everyone for making time. I, I know you probably could have been sitting in any room of your house right now and you chose this room and this screen, so I'm, I'm really honored about that. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's, it's fun to be on a panel with Kelvin because I was actually uh, scheduled to go down and speak at, at Broward County this uh, spring. And so one of, the, one of the many things I had to take off my calendar was that visit. So I, I hope to get back down there another time. Um, and uh, I hope to actually speak inside the physical library. And, you know, I, I appreciate just how uh, important it is to have our libraries up and running 
um, as physical places. I appreciate also all the think ways that libraries have adapted uh, to meet this particular moment. Um, it's an amazing thing that uh, that that libraries uh, have been able to shift as much as they have uh, in, in the, over the last month, few months. But I guess that shouldn't surprise me because if you think about the last few decades, libraries have been just surprisingly capable of evolving to meet contemporary challenges. I mean. If you had asked me 30 years ago, what public institution is going to do the best job evolving uh, to be a 21st century uh, institution that's relevant to people's lives given the way they live now, uh, that can handle the digital transition, uh, I might not have said the library would be on that list. And um, it's just, it's amazing to see what the institution can do. So, you know, you've, you've made this point, but I'm just gonna underscore it again. It, it doesn't make sense to uh, live in a society anymore that's an advanced uh, affluent society where enormous numbers of people don't have internet access at home. It's now really a condition for citizenship, um, for cultural citizenship and for uh, civic engagement, whether it's registering to vote uh, or getting essential news and services or going to school remotely uh, or working remotely. Uh, we just all need it right now. And I think this moment has highlighted just how important it is for us to push on the policy front for something like universal access. Let's, we, you know, we really need to make the internet a, a public utility and make sure every American has one, ha, has a, an easy way of getting service at home. Um, because the disparities that are emerging uh, over the last few months are, are getting amplified. Uh, you know, when, when children, uh, in, in, in poor communities and poor families uh, don't have at home internet access and so can't access school or don't have enough devices uh, and have to share you know their mother's phone at different hours over the day when the mother needs to be there as well it, you know this is uh, it's unsustainable and I really admire the way that the library as an institution has pivoted in this moment and expanded uh, you know delivery of digital services whether it's you know access to ebooks uh, or study study support for for young people or book clubs for older people, I'm not surprised in any way. But I you know since I'm I'm talking with a lot of library people, I just want to kind of salute you here. Um, it's it's remarkable and important. But now it's the summer, and I don't know where you all are, but where I am, it's getting very hot. Uh, it's getting uncomfortable at home. It's harder and harder to just stay indoors. And shelter in place. We're, you know, we're looking for a way to be out in the world, and it's not just the heat uh, that makes it necessary for our health. It's also, it strikes me that, you know, too many Americans are just too fast, uh, frustrated uh, back in the world again. And so, you know, whether the policy is there or not, uh, this summer I think we can expect people to to rush out into public life again. And they're gonna do that whether the library is physically open or not. So I've been thinking a lot about how you might unfold the library and take library services that people really want and need and bring it out into the world. Calvin has talked a lot about partnerships, um, about making the library mobile, about you know, moving it into the airport and the park and to other places, you know, having mobile units, having curbside pick up all those things. I guess I've been thinking uh, and trying to push the IMLS and the ALA on this as well, uh, about what we can do this, this summer in the next few months um, to get the, the libraries as a place to be expanded because we need safe places and we, you know, we need to maintain physical distancing but we don't need social distancing right now. We need, we need social closeness, we need social support, we need, we need social solidarity, and I think the library can help to build that. So one thing I've been wondering, and this is really just an open question for you, is how many libraries are there in the US that have an adjacent space like a parking lot uh, or a big sidewalk or a park or a playground, a, a space that's right next to them or nearby that could be uh, colonized, if you will, for a few months by the library. Could the, could the library move outdoors under a tent 
so that you have uh, you know, services that would ordinarily be inside a building happening outdoors. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know what kind of design ideas are out there for this or programming ideas are out there for this, but it's something I've been pushing up. Don, Don I, can hear, I can see you talking, but I can't hear you. Uh, I'm not saying anything. Okay. Um, no, no problem. Uh, so, so I think there's a really interesting and in my view, urgent question, which in some regions of the country is going to be a relevant question for, you know, the next four months or so. And that is, are there ways in which the library as a place and librarians as workers could be moved out of the library if the library is not able to open? So for instance, um, you know, is there a parking lot that could be tented uh, on days when the weather accommodates so that we could do that? Uh, could librarians go to playgrounds? Could, could librarians be redeployed into playgrounds or parks to run things like, uh, you know, reading hour or, you know, sing-alongs in different languages or uh, book clubs for older people outside of senior centers? What are ways in which librarians, who I think are eager to get uh, back to work in places where they have not been working, um, what are ways that they could be redeployed? And it strikes me that this matters because we are just going to, to, to go out and be together because the library is more than a hub of information. Uh, you know, as, as you said, Don, and this is the theme of my book, the library is an essential social infrastructure. It is a, a, a key gathering place. And I don't know what you think about this moment, but uh, of all the times when we needed some place to help to bind us together, to help establish our common humanity and our common interest, to help to bridge divisions, uh, to help to build some cohesion. It seems to me like we need that now more than ever. You know, as, as we noted in the previous discussion, we are living through one of the most important moments in American history. You know, we're, we're spending more public dollars than we ever have before, more taxpayer dollars to change the economy. It's not clear who we're gonna bail out and who we're not gonna bail out. A lot of politics in this. Um, but there's important democratic work happening. There's important civic work happening. There's one of the most important social movements of our time getting expressed in our, on our sidewalks, on our plazas, in our streets. Um, and it's happening in part because we've all been home for so long, dwelling on the situation, looking at a, a country that looks so manifestly unjust that when we saw uh, a, a case of police killing, uh, a yet another African American. Uh, enormous numbers of Americans said, "Enough, you know, we're done." And so we are. We, I guess, my final message here, Don, is we are coming out. Um, you know, Americans are are flushing themselves out of their homes. We are rushing back into public life, perhaps too early, perhaps unsafely, but it is happening. And the part of me that thinks a lot about harm reduction uh, and how we make things go as well as we possibly can this summer, given how explosive and volatile this moment is, I think we urgently need to think about how the library can reestablish itself as a vital place. And if the library can't open, Eric, we we lost you for about the last fifteen seconds. Oh, it was it was a very stirring uh, speech I made the last fifteen seconds. I'm you guys really missed out. Well, <laughs> recreate it for us. Now, all all I said is I think that you know this is an incredibly important moment in America in, in America, and we might look back on twenty twenty for the rest of our lives as a pivot point. And crises often serve that function in history. They, they move us from one path onto another. And as I see us, where I see us now is at a crossroads. And if you told me a year from now, we're gonna be a fascist country with democracy suppressed and vital democratic institutions uh, weakened, 
I could buy that idea. I, I would not be surprised to hear that. But, but you could also tell me that a year from now, we will have revitalized our democracy. We will have built new gathering places, established new connections, made a profound and new commitment to social justice and racial justice and cohesion. I could see that happening too. And the thing about this moment that's so powerful is it's the first time I think in, in most of our lives where so many things have been up for grabs. You know, you have this feeling like so much, so much is up for grabs. And the next six or seven months are going to change our history and change our future for sure. And I want, I desperately want the library in that conversation. And I want the li I think we need the library now more than ever. So if we can't open the library doors and run programs the way we normally do, the question becomes, how do we take the, 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 the essential activities from the library and bring them out into the world? And are there ways in which we can recreate a, a library in some other outdoor safer place for the time being? Wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take plan B on, the, on your future scenarios there. Uh, but I, I think you're absolutely right, Eric, that, that this, this is a, a pivot point in history. It is clear. Civilization has transformed overnight in response to this pandemic. I mean, we've just shaped every society around what the virus lets us do. It's just a phenomenal thing. And, uh, you know, for good or ill. And uh, democracy has been in retreat for the past few years uh, as authoritarian uh, systems have been on the rise and, and uh, pointing at the American uh, experiment as coming up short, you know, chaotic, dysfunctional. It looks like it's easier to just let somebody decide everything. So it's an attractive alternative. It's in historical terms, it's often turned to uh, a single strong lead, so-called strong leader or model, but it, it never holds up over time. And so this is really the moment for uh, us as a democracy to rise to this challenge. So so thank you for that. It's a, it's a fascinating concept of a library inside out, uh, a distributed library as a physical thing more than just in the, in the digital idea. Uh, a lot of what Kelvin was saying uh, represents those kinds of things. And, and you're, I believe you're absolutely on to that. Uh, it's an enormous design challenge, uh, but I, I take your point exactly. Uh, uh, questions for Eric. Uh, Please, anyone, surely. Uh, Can I just say, as, you th as yeah. you're thinking of your questions, it's a design challenge. It's also, you know, you talked about political will. It's a policy challenge for library leaders because it means you have to persuade local leaders that it's worth making a short-term investment in the, the physical plant of the library so that you can operate over the next few months. And you have to be able to make the case that what you have capacity to do really going to be essential in the summer and I think we've already seen uh, I think we've we've already seen just how dangerous it is to say go about city life as, or community life as you always will and we'll just have the police regulate you know things on the streets I think we don't want that world and there's a lot of conversations about how do we promote civility and safety and security without a heavy police presence and let me just suggest that when we have a programmed public space you know, whether it's a librarian or a parks worker or someone who works in a youth corps, uh, we, we are much more successful at promoting peace. And I think librarians have something extraordinary to offer in this moment. They do. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm curious, when, you, when did you, shall we say, discover libraries or rediscover libraries? How did you, just, have you always felt this way about libraries or? No, you know, so I grew up in, in downtown Chicago uh, in the 1970s and 80s. And, uh, you know, the public libraries were in a horrible condition at that time in Chicago. They were, you know, they were, they were not great places to be. As in many cities, we were living through a fiscal crisis and, and we we're about to live through another one. And, you know, the budget for libraries was really slashed. Um, and you could tell. And so, uh, honestly, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, an academic, and so I have uh, university libraries I use, but I didn't really rediscover all the things that happen in public libraries until I became a father and had children and had started uh -huh. using the New York, New, New York Public Library. 
And then, you know, to be, uh, when it got to the next level, after the uh, election of 2016, I became pretty despondent about America and pretty worried about what was happening to our, our civic uh, life. And um, uh, I was really concerned about uh, the, the fate of our democratic culture. And I started going to branch libraries in New York City on a pretty regular basis. Not just the ones in my neighborhood, but you know, in the Lower East Side, uh, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in Queens. And nothing made me feel as good about the United States as an ongoing project as the libraries. And so I just, I, I, you know, when I feel down, I go to the library. And I, and, and I haven't been able to do that these last few months and I've been feeling pretty down. So it's been hard. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, it, you're right. I, it happened to me pretty much the same way. Once you start looking, the more you see, and you just keep seeing more and more and more of what libraries are, what they can what they always have been, what they can be. And you just, I mean, if you care much about society, you can't not value public libraries. Uh, and yet, uh, right now, uh, budget challenges are coming. I mean, they're landing, these collapses. We can't write trillion dollar checks and not expect them to come due. Uh, and at the local level, we're seeing a lot of pressure, downward pressure on, on, the, on the local budgets and libraries are, are under the gun. So that your point about getting out and making the case for library and services, it's essential nature in the community. This is the time to do that and showing, you know, demonstrating new kinds of services is exactly the way to do that. Librarians have not been especially good at uh, tooting their own horn. And so that's kind of what we've taken on as a, as an avocation anyway, uh, is to do that. Um, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next few months, couple of months, uh, the run up to school, I think, as I said in the beginning, is probably the most urgent logistical societal challenge we're facing right now. If we can't open school successfully, even marginally, uh, society is going to be mostly paralyzed by uh, 50 something million K-12 students uh, in and out of home or school or however they're going to do it. And hopefully libraries are going to be there in, in support and we're encouraging them to partner with their schools to figure out how to build these kind of new learning and information systems that can support learners of all ages. So uh, this, is, this is fascinating, Eric. We really appreciate you uh, being with us today uh, and, and sharing your insights and, and, and your inspirations. We've had a lot of people uh, uh, on the chat here uh, echoing uh, my praise and also someone saying they're about to go read all of your books. Ah. So that, that should be good. That, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, at least if you have palaces for the people in your, in your library, I'll be happy. Um, you know, it's been, before this happened, uh, I was in the practice of going to do public speeches at libraries once or twice a week. I was on the road all the time. I, I, the, the, right before we went into isolation in New York, uh, you know, we, we got hit pretty hard. Uh, we didn't want to see people all the time. And the day before we went into isolation, I was speaking in, uh, in Cleveland. Uh, Cuyahoga County did a one community, one book re uh, event, which was, which was terrific. And, um, you know, that, I, you know, having not been able to go to the library, you know, not just as a visitor, but also to speak and to meet people and to, to help make the case publicly that the library is an essential institution and needs our support. You know, it's not a luxury good, uh, you know, has caused me some pain. I, I really have missed a lot of visits to libraries where we go and try to do some advocacy for the institution because as, as much as I love uh, all the library people I've met, I've learned that you guys are not your best advocates all the time. Um, you, it, it's very hard to advocate and, 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 and speak, speak up for yourself. Uh, but the library is such a, it's just such an important part of American life right now. You all know that uh, last year, more Americans went to libraries and went to movies, sports events, you know, concerts, 
all those things. It's, it's, it's just such a big part of who we are. And not many countries on earth, probably no countries have a library system like we have with these amazing branches and this principle of, you know, universal access uh, and, and the spirit of generosity. I always say when I talk to people about libraries that if the library didn't exist today and we had to go pitch it to our governors or to the White House, uh, there's no chance that we would get it. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's extraordinary and, and surprising that, that we have the libraries that we have. And um, now we're gonna have to fight for them because I guarantee you, everybody on this call who's working the library is gonna find that the people who run their city would like to reduce your budget significantly in some cases. And so it's, it's, this is, this is going to be a fight. Well, here we are. I would, I would suppose that, that if civilization completely collapsed, it would reemerge around something that you could call a library, that people would just naturally gravitate toward each other to share things, information, and that starts to become a library. I think it's the most natural thing in the world, in spite of the fact that you make the point that uh, they're not as strong uh, in most other countries as they are in the U.S. That's something, that's another level of advocacy that we've undertaken is to promote universal public access everywhere. I mean, everywhere. There's still three and a half billion people in the world that are not connected. We're talking about a, a few tens of millions in the U.S. So it's a huge task and it's one the libraries are suited and built for. So uh, can I ask everybody to unmute right now, please? If you can just unmute, that'd be great, please. Because I would like to uh, thank Kelvin and Eric and, uh, with, a, with a round of applause. Everybody, please. Hey. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you all. Great. Thank you. Good luck. So, Good luck, everyone. Thank you again, both of you. It's been great today. Uh, this will be recorded and available. We'll send out a follow-up uh, summary of the session with links and, uh, uh, and be back next week with uh, launching this uh, new wireless thread. We're going to have Michael Calabrese from the uh, New America Foundation Open Technology Institute to kick us off, talking about various uh, wireless resources that are available today. Because I think that point that uh, Eric was making about the next few weeks and few months are critical. And so what can we do in the near term? That's kind of what we're focused on. And so with that, uh, Stephen, let's uh, end this recording. Thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to hang around. And uh, if anybody wants to talk, chat, we'll be here. But we're going to stop the recording now.